Did you know that cybercrime is going to cost the world economy $10.5 trillion annually by the year 2025? To put that in perspective, were cybercrime a country, it would be the third largest economy behind America and China. As we all know, cybercriminals have been targeting crypto sites and exchanges pretty much since day one. And as more money flows into the crypto economy, those pesky hackers are putting more and more effort into targeting businesses in the crypto space. So today we're looking at some of the largest crypto heists of all time and also how those maniacal cyber crooks pulled them off. But first, my name is Trev, and here at CoinMarketCap, we are on a mission to make crypto accessible all around the world. That's why we love making videos for you that are packed with information that are easy to understand and simple to share with your friends and family. So if you want something more than just hype and to actually learn about crypto, then make sure to hit the subscribe button right now and to turn on notifications so you're not gonna miss out on our new videos and let's learn together. So how much is being stolen from crypto sites and exchanges around the world? Well, between 2011 and 2019, nearly $3 billion worth of crypto was stolen in a variety of scams and schemes. If that seems like a lot of stolen cash, you should know that the amount being stolen is rising every year. According to a blockchain security firm called Surtech, the DeFi space lost $1.3 billion in hacks in 2021, double the amount lost in 2020, and that's just DeFi. Business Insider estimates that hackers stole around $4 billion across the entire crypto space last year. So why is crypto theft increasing? Well, one reason is that crypto is a victim of its own success. In other words, where the money flows, the thieves will surely follow, which is why healthcare, finance, and technology are the three sectors most frequently targeted by cyber criminals. In fact, one survey found that 70% of all financial institutions were the victim of some level of cyber attack last year. And as the global crypto market cap soared from two $250 billion a few years back to nearly $3 trillion at its peak last year, cyber crooks have been launching more and more hacking attacks on crypto businesses. Another reason that hackers are attracted to crypto is because they have access to far more money for less effort than they do elsewhere. For instance, duping people into handing over their seed phrases to steal their crypto is far easier than convincing them to share their banking passwords. Hackers can transfer huge sums of money anywhere anonymously, and this also makes crypto an attractive target for hackers as well. During the past 10 years, we've seen more than 100 serious hacks of crypto exchanges and other cryptocurrency related services. It's easy to learn who was hacked and how much money was stolen, but how the hackers pulled off the heist isn't always clear, mostly because the hackers don't want to give their game away. According to Surtech, the cybersecurity firm, centralization was the most exploited vulnerability by far in 2021. Another common exploit is hackers manipulating users to gain control control over their private keys, which lets them access and drain a platform smart contracts. As for the individual user who has had their crypto stolen, most were duped by phishing emails purporting to be from MetaMask and asking for their private keys. So before we get into our three biggest crypto hacks, know that the way we've assembled our list is by the dollar value of the stolen assets at the time they were stolen, rather than the value of those assets today. So without further ado, let's take a look at the three biggest crypto hacks of all time starting with Mt. Gox. So if you've only been into crypto for the past few years, you might not have heard about Mt. Gox before now, and that's probably because it actually doesn't exist anymore. So Mt. Gox was a hugely popular Bitcoin exchange based in Tokyo, Japan, and it takes its name from Magic the Gathering online exchange. The exchange got up and running in July of 2010, and at its peak in 2014, the site handled 70% of all Bitcoin transactions. Right from the get-go, Mt. Gox was subject to a lot of suspicion and rightly so. The exchange lost around 25,000 bitcoins belonging to 478 customers in June of 2011. And it was around this time in the middle of 2011 that one or a group of hackers began to slowly siphon off bitcoin from Mt. Gox's hot wallet. And very little happened from here until three years later in early February of 2014, when Mt. Gox users started complaining about slow withdrawal times from the exchange on Reddit and bitcoin forums. At this point, the more skeptical users were questioning whether Mt. Gox really had their Bitcoin. And so rumors of a much bigger problem began circulating around the web. When suddenly halfway through February, Mt. Gox suspended all trading and customer withdrawals, claiming to have found unusual activity in its wallets. The announcement immediately sent Bitcoin's price spiraling downwards, and people who had trusted Mt. Gox with their Bitcoin went into a frenzy. In a futile effort to calm things down, a Mt. Gox spokesperson explained that the exchange wasn't at fault, and that the delays were caused by a bug 
in Bitcoin's code, which allowed users to alter transaction details to make it seem as if a transaction didn't take place when it actually did. But as another week went by, the exchange still wasn't allowing any of its customers to withdraw their funds. At this point, tempers had reached fever pitch. Mt. Gox customers were frantically calling and emailing anybody and everybody, trying to force the company to tell them what was going on and why they couldn't access their money. And within a few days, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and a smattering of other media giants picked up on the story, reporting that Mt. Gox's CEO, Mark Capellis, had resigned. Obviously, Capellis's resignation only added fuel to the roaring fire, the flames of which flickered higher when the company suddenly purged its Twitter account and took down its website. Unfortunately, Carpellis's resignation was pretty much all of the media could report, because despite the crypto space being in a meltdown and Mt. Gox had protesters outside of its offices, nobody in the company had let it slip what was actually going on. And at this point, they were insisting that a bug in Bitcoin's code was responsible for the delays. But Mt. Gox's radio silence didn't last long. The following day, a confidential internal crisis document was leaked to the press, which indicated that Mt. Gox was insolvent and at least 744,408 Bitcoins had been stolen from the exchange's hot wallet. This bombshell eviscerated any chance of Mt. Gox maintaining calm or keeping control of the narrative. There were outpourings of grief and wrath all over the web. But most of all, Mt. Gox's customers desperately wanted to know if they could even get their money back. And in a sad but somewhat unsurprising turn for the exchange's loyal customers, Mt. Gox filed for bankruptcy a few days later. Should it have been successful, the motion would have dashed any hopes for the exchange's customers getting their money back. In another surprising twist, reports emerged in the press a few weeks later that Carpellis had stumbled upon 200,000 bitcoins in an archived file in the cloud, a file he claims he had forgotten about and that nobody had used for three years. For some, Carpellis's discovery seemed a little too convenient, and more than a few people speculated that he was A, the mastermind behind the robbery, and B, now was trying to buy his way out of jail. At around the same time, a Swedish software engineer called Kim Nilsson, who had lost Bitcoin from Mt. Gox, launched WizSec, a cybersecurity startup dedicated to cracking the case. And in the summer of 2017, three and a half years later, Nilsson and his cyber team appear to have achieved their goal. By tracing each wallet that had received funds stolen from Mt. Gox, Nilsson found that the bulk of the Bitcoins stolen from Mt. Gox were linked to just one person, a Russian national called Alexander Vinnik. Nilsson contacted the IRS in America and a few other agencies, and a month or so later, Vinnik was arrested in Greece and indicted on 21 counts of money laundering. However, the charges made no mention of Mt. Gox's hack, and to date, he hasn't been charged for his alleged part in the heist and maintains his innocence. At the time of his arrest, Vinnik was sought by the American, French, New Zealand, and Russian authorities for various charges including fraud and money laundering. He has since been sentenced to five years in jail for money laundering, which he's serving in France. A month after Vinnik's arrest in August of 2017, Mt. Gox's ex-CEO Carpellis was arrested by the Japanese authorities, and he spent the following 11 months in prison, where he claims to have been kept in solitary confinement and interrogated for eight hours every single day. He was eventually found guilty of falsifying data to exaggerate Mt. Gox's assets, for which he was sentenced to two and a half years in prison. He was not found guilty on all the more serious charges like embezzlement. Since the breach, several investigations, including WizSex, have revealed that the true number of Bitcoin stolen over the three-year period was around 850,000, not counting the 200,000 found by Carpellis. And to put that into perspective, that's around 4% of all Bitcoins. When the news of the hack was made public, those Bitcoins were worth around $470 million, but most of them were sold for less. But had the Bitcoin been sold at its peak price last year, they would have been worth a mind-melting $58 billion. So what happened to all those Bitcoins? Well, it appears that most of them were sold right away, possibly by Vinik, which is quite ironic because the thieves made around $20 million by selling the Bitcoins right away. Whereas if they found a way to hold on to them, they would have been billionaires. So the most recent development from this story came in November of last year, when a Japanese court announcement that Mt. Gox had finally reached a compensation agreement with its creditors, providing some semblance of closure to the story of Mt. Gox. The Mt. Gox affair was terrible for Bitcoin's reputation, and even worse for its price. During the month when most of the drama played, Bitcoin lost nearly half of its value, and it would take two and a half years for Bitcoin to clamor out of its hole. And the next one is CoinCheck, a popular Tokyo-based crypto exchange and digital wallet provider. The firm launched in 2012 and is currently the 
16th largest exchange by trading volume today. During its early years, Coincheck seemed destined to grow into one of the largest and most popular crypto exchanges in the world. But all of that changed in January of 2018 when the company announced that it had suffered a huge hack and $532 million worth of crypto was missing from its books. The hackers had targeted just one crypto called NEM, an open source crypto and blockchain project. If you're new to crypto, you might not know about NEM, but at the time it was the 10th largest crypto with a market cap of nearly $400 million. The hackers were able to transfer the NEM tokens simply because Coincheck hadn't installed anywhere near enough security. Quite early on, the exchange admitted that its reliance on hot wallets that didn't require multiple sign-offs for transfers was the weakness that allowed hackers to make off with the cash. And soon after the news of the hack was made public, Coincheck froze deposits and halted customer withdrawals while its security team tried to figure out what had happened. Unfortunately, Coincheck had only discovered the breach eight hours after the hackers had withdrawn the funds. The following day, a Coincheck spokesperson admitted that the exchange probably wouldn't be able to return its client's assets, but that it had managed to track down the 11 wallets to which the hackers had transferred the stolen funds. At the same time, the NEM Foundation, which manages the NEM coin, announced that it was not going to hard fork its blockchain, which would have allowed Coincheck to get its missing money back quickly and easily. So although there was no easy fix for Coincheck's problems, the NEM Foundation did develop a helpful tracking tool that let exchanges reject any of the funds stolen from the Coincheck's wallets. The foundation also marked each of the hacker's wallets containing the stolen funds with a message indicating that the wallets belonged to the hackers who had stolen money from Coincheck. Although Coincheck was undeniably doing everything it could to find its lost money and return it to its customers, it still wasn't moving fast enough to placate the authorities. On the 2nd of February, the Japanese Financial Services Agency raided Coincheck's offices to find out how the hack was allowed to happen and whether anything could be done to return the stolen money back to its rightful owners. Unfortunately, to this day, neither Coincheck nor the NEM Foundation has ever been able to recover any of the stolen money. Coincheck has since admitted that a shortage of employees contributed to a substandard security that made a hack possible. And in an admiral move, the exchange used its capital reserves to fully compensate all of its customers who have lost out from the breach. And honestly, that just goes to show that the crypto space still has plenty of good guys, even if their security is a little slack sometimes. The Poly Network is a DeFi interlopability protocol that connects 11 diverse blockchains to facilitate peer-to-peer -peer transactions. Right off the bat, we want to make it clear that the Poly Network is not Polygon. Yes, they both have Poly in the name, but that's where the similarities end. They are two very distinct networks. So the Poly Network links up different blockchains, while Polygon is a layer 2 scalability solution enabling faster transactions on Ethereum. So going back to the hack, on August 10th of 2021, an anonymous white hat hacker attacked the Poly Network. In case you haven't heard, white hat hackers are also known as ethical hackers, and they use their cyber superpowers for good, and their counterparts, black hat hackers, use their powers for evil. So the hacker or group of hackers made off with around $610 million in digital assets, made up of 2,858 ETH worth around $270 million, as well as $250 million in Binance coins and around $85 million in USDC tokens. The Poly Network's Twitter account posted an appeal to the hackers, urging them to communicate with them, and that the funds were stolen not from the network itself, but rather from the tens of thousands of members of its crypto community. So according to analysis, from around the time of the breach, the hackers managed to exploit a vulnerability with a smart contract used to transfer tokens between different blockchains, which stored large amounts of liquidity. The analysis suggested that the hackers had managed to override the smart contract's instructions and diverted the funds to wallets under their control instead. But all of a sudden, a plot twist worthy of Ocean's Eleven changed everything the following day. To seemingly everybody's surprise, the hackers announced that they would return all of the tokens they had stolen from Poly, claiming that the purpose of their heist was to reveal critical vulnerabilities in Poly's network. The hackers then started up a Q&A for the public to ask them questions, where they had assured people that they had only carried out the heist for fun and to encourage the Poly network to strengthen its security. However, the wider public still remained skeptical about the hackers' true motives. Gervis Grigg, formerly a part of the FBI and currently the CTO at Chain Analysis, suggested that the real white hat hackers wouldn't steal such a large amount of money only to give it back later, and that the hackers probably returned the money due to difficulties laundering it. A few weeks later, in a Twitter post, the Poly Network revealed that it had regained control of all of its assets, except for $33 million in USDT, which had been frozen by its issuer, Tether. Once all of the money 
had been returned to the Poly Network, the hackers who have been dubbed Mr. White Hat have been offered $500,000 worth of ether as a thank you for finding the bug and have been offered a job as Poly's chief security advisor. So since the hack, the Poly Network has launched a bug bounty program where White Hat hackers can try to find flaws in the network security in exchange for a fee. The highest rewards are reported to be up to $100,000 per bug. And obviously not every hack turns out this way. Most of the time the robbers get away with their loot and thousands of customers are left out of pocket. Let's be thankful that for once, the good guys won. Hey, did you like that video? Yeah, well, make sure to check out these other videos here because if you like this video, you're probably gonna like these videos. So what are you doing? Go check out those videos and like and subscribe while you're at it. So yeah, check them out.